with respect to Thai, to Sukho Cheng Kong, and to all our ancestral teachers through many generations. Dear community, today is the 7th of August in the year 2016, and we are in our Wake Up Earth Retreat in the still water meditation hall of the upper hamlet. They call me Sister True Dedication, (laughs) and I am made of non-me elements. (laughs) So it's not really me sitting here today, but it is uh, all the elements who have made me, um, including our wonderful Sangha, my sisters and brothers, our teacher, and also my parents, my mother, my father. I come from England, and when the Sangha had a chance to visit my parents in England, there were many brothers and sisters who then said, Ah, (laughs) now I get it. Now I know why you are like how you are. We are made of our mother and our father. And many of us have a beautiful aspiration in our own lifetime to transform and heal and repair some of the weaknesses of our parents and Uh, My own experience was that I didn't spend enough time cherishing their qualities as well. Our mother and father have transmitted many wonderful qualities to us. I can sit here because my father transmitted courage. (laughs) And as I was breathing, my heart was beating and my breath was very short. And we have a practice to breathe with often our father's lungs. Thai would invite us. As we sit in meditation, I breathe with my father's lungs. I sit with my father's back. But my father has short breath. (laughs) So this morning, I breathed with my mother's lungs. My mom has very big lungs. And that helped me a lot. Mm. I'm also here um, with the energy of the sunrise from this morning, with the wonderful food that we've been eating and that many of us have been preparing. Mm. So we inter are. I inter am with you all. And you all inter are with me and with everything in the cosmos. Tai has a wonderful line that I really like. He says, uh, you cannot be by yourself alone. You have to <laughs> inter be with the whole cosmos. You inter are with the whole cosmos. Mm. I would often point to the flower on the podium and say, every flower is made of non-flower elements. And my first reaction, I have to confess, is, but I'm not a flower. (laughs) (laughs) But it is still true that we are made of non-us elements. And that is the good news That is uh, a delight, it is a joy, and it is something we can uh, discover and touch every day. Um, uh, I was very touched when I heard Thay say that we all need a spiritual dimension in our life. And hearing that, I thought, yes. I am thirsty for a spiritual dimension to my life. 
my soul is thirsty. And in our life here in uh, a practice center like Plum Village, we have so many opportunities to keep the spiritual dimension of our life alive, nourished, and connected. And we have these meditation poems that we use throughout the day when we touch running water, perhaps we're taking some water to drink, or we're opening the tap to wash our face. And we contemplate the water, and we have a beautiful poem. Water comes from high mountain sources. Water runs deep in the earth. Miraculously, Water comes to us and sustains all life. My gratitude is filled to the brim. So we have the simple actions to serve water, to draw water. But somehow we look deeply and with our mindfulness, we connect ourselves to the true nature of the water. It has come from the mountains. It has come from the oceans. And now it is becoming a part of us. And when I used to work in an office, I recited this poem at the water cooler. <laughs> I was on the sixth floor in the center of the city of London. And I felt connected to the whole cosmos. <laughs> and I could have a magical minute no one knew I was doing it, a magical minute as I drank my water. When we take a shower, we can ask ourselves, whose body is this? Where has it come from? What was the warmth the original warmth that made this body. It has been handed from generation to generation and never got cold. <laughs> I am English and I like to drink tea. So I invented a poem for uh, boiling the kettle. <laughs> Often when we have a difficult moment, uh, culturally, we put the kettle on. <laughs> it's our first response. <laughs> and so having a moment to feel spiritual <laughs> about boiling the kettle uh, enriched my life. And uh, when we write a poem like this, we look at all the different elements that are coming together in the miracle of life uh, to support us. So there is the water, there is the energy in the electricity. Where has it come from? And then there's me, and where have I come from? And we have all traveled since beginningless time to arrive in this moment of making a cup of tea. <laughs> So I invite all of us to write our own poems. Choose one or two things in your day, daily actions, that you would like to become spiritual moments for you in your day, where there is mindfulness, where there is deep looking. And Thay has said that any act we do can become sacred when we have the energy of mindfulness to enrich it. In the early mornings here, we've had a chance to come and practice sitting meditation together and to enjoy the beautiful walking meditation together in the silence of the morning. And a few years ago, in a winter retreat, Tai was staying in his hut on the side of the hill. 
And he said that one that morning he stepped out and he saw this sky filled with stars and he felt such love for the earth, for this planet and this beautiful cosmos. And later that day or the next day when he gave a Dharma talk, he said that he had fallen in love with the earth. He had realized he was in love with the earth. I often ask myself, am I in love with the earth yet? <laughs> we speak about the wonders of life and when I look deeply and see the wonderful mm, diversity of Earth's manifestations, how many millions or billions of years they have taken to evolve, I have a kind of awe and wonder. And the fragility and beauty of life. And I am training myself to cherish this as much as I can. But sometimes it's not so easy. I think I grew up in a fairly cynical environment in my society, in my generation. Somehow a tree just didn't seem exciting. <laughs> but I am learning to look with the eyes of wonder and to see the miracle that a tree is or a bug, or any kind of living being, or even any human being. So I am training myself to fall in love with the earth, to learn more about the earth. And Thay has said that if we love the earth, if we love the earth enough, then we will know what to do in order to help protect the earth. And we will have the energy we need to protect the earth because love is a wonderful source of energy. It sustains us, it nourishes us, it keeps us happy, it keeps our mind fresh and delighted. I came to Plum Village when I was almost 22 years old. And I had a lot of questions. I just graduated and I had felt that my education had cheated me. <laughs> I asked myself, who am I? Who am I? And somehow my degree, my university degree in my school hadn't told me. <laughs> I, I was asking myself, what do I want? What do I really want in my life? Of course, I asked the question, and why am I here? <laughs> Meaning, why am I here on this planet? What am I here to do? Why am I here? But the fact is, I wasn't yet practicing mindfulness, so I wasn't very present at all. <laughs> so I don't think I could say I was even present here when I asked the question, why am I here? <laughs> but slowly, I'm learning to be more present. Hmm. I also wanted to know, what can I trust? What can I count on? 
What can I rely on? Mother Nature is often smiling to us. We can usually rely on the fact that nature is smiling to us. And in particular, in difficult moments, in moments of crisis, in moments when I feel overwhelmed, I wanted to know what can I rely on. <coughs> I also wanted to know where am I going? Like, what is the direction? I had this feeling like I'd been on a conveyor belt and I have to do this set of exams and then you have to go to this school and do that set of exams and then you have to get to a university. And I felt like I was spat out, <laughs> age 22. <laughs> and uh, the conveyor belt still had a lot of energy telling me, okay, now you need to do this, you need to have this kind of career. You need to go there, learn this. And I felt I hadn't yet stopped to really ask myself, where am I going and where do I want to go? How much of this direction until now is me? <laughs> and how much is everything around me pushing me? We have a story in the uh, Buddhist tradition about someone on a horse riding very fast par past the crossroads. And there's a man standing there and he says, where are you going so fast? <laughs> and the rider says, I don't know, ask the horse. <laughs> so, are we on a horse? Do we know where our horse is going? What are the elements that have given energy to the horse? What is pushing us? Have we mastered the horse yet? Hmm. Since I've come to Plum Village and been living here, I've learned that it takes a while to learn how to ride. <laughs> takes some training, but we can do it. We can master the horse. And another question I had was, how can I help? I had a sense that I have some energy and I see there are problems in the world and I want to know, what can I do to help? So slowly here, I think there's a poet who once said, we live our way to the answers. Rilke, I think. So I'm living my way to answer these questions. <laughs> and I hope that we can all actively live our way to answer these questions. Some of you may know that we have a five-year monastic training program in Plum Village. And it wasn't an option when I ordained. So as we learned yesterday, I didn't have to suffer from having too much choice. <laughs> Just made a lifetime commitment. <laughs> but when it came to five years and Tai was convinced that five years is more than enough to be able to learn a lot of things and then go out into the world and continue to be a teacher in lay society so when I got to five years I had to do a reality check <laughs> And I asked myself, what have I learned? <laughs> and um, this is what I discovered. I have learned how to eat. <laughs> it's harder than you think. How to listen to my body, how to choose the right foods, how to feel connected when I eat how to nourish joy for myself and others with food, how to respect life as I eat, how to nourish my compassion as I eat. 
So maybe I haven't completely mastered it, <laughs> but I, I've made good progress. Um, how to sleep. I think only by arriving and living in the monastery did I discover how unstable my life was, and I imagine it's the case for many of us. Are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting good quality sleep? Do you know how to prepare yourselves to have a good night's sleep? How to wake up without a headache? How to smile to yourself as you wake up in the morning? I've made good progress on this one, <laughs> but I'm not a master yet, as my sisters uh, in the last week can tell you. <laughs> I've also somehow learned something about taking care of my body and mind, handling my body and mind, listening to my body and mind. So it's something about energy. Life is energy. Uh, that horse that is pushing us is a kind of energy. And have we learned how to listen to our a unique combination of energies so that we can master them like riding a horse so that we can live beautifully, peacefully, happily as much as possible. And this is what Tai has said, what is more important than to know ourselves, how to generate happiness in our daily life, and how to handle difficulties, suffering. And Tai has reassured us this is possible. We can learn how to generate moments of happiness in our day, and we can also learn how to handle our suffering our difficulties, how to not feel overwhelmed, and how we can learn what to do in difficult moments. And when I first came here, I didn't know any of these things as a 20, almost 22-year-old. I didn't know how to generate happiness, and I didn't know how to handle my suffering. And sometimes our suffering may have come to us from previous generations. It's not exactly ours. Perhaps the seed of sadness or despair. This is what I discovered. My seed of sadness and despair had been transmitted to me. I'd done a fair bit of helping it grow too, but I had received a strong seed already from, from my parents and from my grandparents, and probably their parents, because even our parents are not just themselves. They are also their parents. And each of us has a treasure trove of, of elements that we've received from our ancestors, and we need to know what they are, and we need to know how to handle them. At least, I needed to know what they were, and I needed to know how to handle them so that I could feel free in my life and so that I could answer some of these questions. We learn here that we are made of many different elements. And I would like to draw something on the board to illustrate this. So we can see ourselves as five different rivers. We have our body, our physical body. And Tai often likes to draw this with the segments of a clementine, tangerine. Okay. So we have our body that has been transmitted to us from many generations. 
that we nourish with everything we eat. I wish it was a 360 degree board, but it's not. <laughs> body, body, body. Okay. And the next segment is our feelings. Feelings. They may come from the body or from our emotions. Our perceptions. perceptions. So our perceptions is how we are perceiving things, how we are perceiving the world, ourselves, other people situations. Generally, most of them are wrong. <laughs> okay. And then we have our mental formations. So based on our perceptions and feelings, we give rise to a state of mind, a mental formation. could be something like frustration, or anger, or depression, sadness, or joy, some positive ones, <laughs> hope. Okay. And then we have consciousness. Which is the ground of our being. So to share a little bit more about consciousness, um, <laughs> our teacher likes to draw a circle, but I'm not very good at drawing circles. So I've got some help. <laughs> uh, okay. I think that must be my English ancestors rather than my Vietnamese ancestors. <laughs> okay. So, our body and our mind. Thai often speaks about two levels of the mind. So we have the upper part of our mind and the lower part. And we call the upper part mind consciousness. and the lower part, store. Okay. So here, we are talking a lot about store consciousness, and this is where we have all the seeds, these elements that have been transmitted to us, that we carry, and that are potentials in life. So, we have seeds like uh, joy and hope, uh, mindfulness, um, peace, and some other ones like anger, <laughs> fear, anxiety. Any others we can think of? Jealousy, very good. Sadness. Sadness. Compassion. Compassion, wonderful. Desire, craving. <laughs> craving. <laughs> Sometimes we crave, well, we usually crave sensual pleasures, but we may also crave money, status, fame, power. It's a little bit bigger than the other ones, you see. Okay. <laughs> Any more? No. Doubt? Pride. Oh, pride. Wonderful. How big is that? Probably a bit. Yeah. Okay, and we have doubt. So we have a lot of seeds. And somehow our store consciousness is both individual 
and collective. We also share it. So when the seed of fear in society is very strong, our own seed of fear will be, um, will take more place, will be more active. And if our parents have transmitted to us a strong seed down here, then it will be more strong perhaps than in other people. And our mind is receiving information from our sense doors, from our eyes, our ears, our nose, and our tongue. And from our body. Okay. So information is coming in all the time. (laughs) So when we watch a news bulletin or we listen to the radio, that will come in and it may water the seed of fear in us or the seed of anger in us. And that seed will then come up and manifest in the upper level of our consciousness. So when we want to learn how to handle our mind, we need to know what to do when this happens. First of all, we need to know anger has come up, fear has come up, sadness has come up. So we have to recognize, we have to identify that it's happened. And that's why we need the energy of mindfulness. Mindfulness helps us to know what is going on. So the energy of mindfulness is another seed. And if we say that it's the seed of anger that has come up, we can say that mindfulness comes up and embraces the anger. So you have one energy, which is the anger, and we have the other energy, which is our compassion. I said compassion because uh, (laughs) the antidote to anger is compassion. So we have mindfulness, embracing the anger. And if we can generate an energy of compassion, that will help cool the anger. So what I have been learning here is to have a strategy for when different uh, mental formations come up and to know how to invite certain seeds to come up in order to embrace the one that has manifested. So many different seeds have different kind of antidotes. So we could say that when we have restlessness, the antidote might be relaxation. If we feel restless, maybe we could spend 10 or 20 minutes to relax. Or if we feel sadness, perhaps a 5 or 10 minute bath in the present moment will refresh us. We can nourish ourselves with the wonders of life. But if the sadness is a bit stronger and it takes the form of despair, we have to have a even stronger strategy. And I've learned that uh, the antidote to despair, we have a bodhisattva who is fearless and persevering. So we have an energy of hope and we are fearless and we don't give up. (laughs) And that is how we handle our seed of despair. That is how I have learned to handle my seed of despair. And we have many wonderful practices to cultivate non-fear, like the five remembrances, aware that we are of the nature to grow old, to get sick, and 
to die and to be separated from those we love, we have a contemplation on that, and that helps us strengthen our non-fear. We accept the reality, and we cultivate courage and non-fear. And sometimes the seeds that come up are very big and overwhelming, and some of us may have had that experience. There's not even space for mindfulness <laughs> to intervene. And those are the moments when we need to practice uh, a kind of emergency practice. And for me, my emergency practice has been something that Thai has taught us to do, which is deep belly breathing. So when our mind has a seed running riot, <laughs> we have to... Uh, come down from here, which has become a chaos of a thunderstorm, and we have to bring our energy down to our breathing. So we take our energy down from the upper level of our consciousness, and we just breathe, and we trust in the, that the good seeds down here will have some space to help respond to the situation. So if necessary, we lie down, we take ourselves out of the situation that has triggered our anger or, or our sadness or our despair. And we put our hand, I put my hands on my belly and I bring all my attention, 100% to the rising and the falling of my abdomen. And I often give myself the challenge that I have to follow the breath all the way through and all the way back again, strictly no thinking. <laughs> and it's not very easy. But if we have our hands on our belly and we are fascinated by the experience of our in-breath and our out-breath, I've discovered that with practice, it's possible to breathe 10 times in and out with not a single thought. And I do it like snakes and ladders. So if I have a thought, I have to start again and count from one. <laughs> and I started doing this because I thought, if I cannot even master my breathing, who am I to know what to do in this situation? My mind is not clear. My mind, I haven't got a grip on my mind. So I shouldn't trust my mind in this situation. It has no right to, to have a voice until it has breathed 10 times. <laughs> and the amazing thing is that after 10 breaths, there's clarity, there is stability. It may, on a bad day, it may take 20 minutes or 25 minutes to have 10 clear breaths, but after that there is clarity, and we know what to do and what not to do. So somehow I have learned not to trust my mind, but to trust my breathing. If in doubt, <laughs> breathe. <laughs> and it has never failed me, and that has given me a real solid basis, something I always know I can trust and I don't need to be afraid because I always know that the breathing, when I breathe fully, 100%, <laughs> will help calm, clarify and give me courage.
So what we are taking in through our sense organs is a kind of food. And that is going to affect how our mind is going to operate. So our sense impressions, what we watch, movies, websites, what we listen to, music, or even conversations, uh, what we smell. You will notice that uh, some you were very sensitive to certain kinds of smell. What we eat, so the kinds of foods, edible foods that we eat, they are nourishing something in us. So if we eat food that has uh, violence or suffering in it, then somehow we are, that is becoming a part of us and that is affecting who we are. But if we are able to eat with compassion, then our seed of compassion here will grow. So every day you can have a day without meat. <laughs> you can say to yourself, I have nourished my seed of compassion today. And I have not nourished my seed of violence or of suffering. And we know that the animals suffer deeply when they are killed. And that is what we are eating. And when we eat meat that is destroying our planet to cultivate that meat, then we are also eating something that is not wholesome. We are not nourishing our compassion and our care. So we, we can learn about four kinds of nutriments. Four nutriments. So the first is edible foods. Edible foods and drink. So this includes orange juice and alcohol. <laughs> okay. So we know that it takes a lot of grain to make liquor. And maybe that grain could be better used for something else. Our earth is in need of our help. Our sense impressions. That's all the movies. The movies, the music, and so on. Even now, I still remember movies I watched 20 years ago. <laughs> they come up sometimes even in my meditation. And I think, God, how did I let that come in? Because once it's come in, it's somehow there in our memory. And it's very... Um, trusting of us. We go into a cinema, we, we even pay for the privilege for someone else to then put all this stuff into our consciousness that may be violent or disturbing, um, unpleasant. So we have to be very careful when we choose uh, what to watch and feel free to walk out. I guess yeah, I didn't have enough courage to walk out of cinemas or to switch off movies, but I think we need to be able to switch them off. Okay. The third kind is volition. This volition, it comes from the word will or like volonté. It's a kind of technical word, but it just means our deepest desire. Do you know what you want to do with your life? What you really, really want to do with your life? What is your deepest desire? And our deepest desire is like a seed that we've planted in our consciousness. And when we can identify it and take care of it, 
it will be a great source of energy in our life. And we need to know what we want to do. Life is precious. We don't know how much of it we have. <laughs> we would like to think that we will all live to 80, but maybe that won't be the case. So what do you want to do? We have this one body, we have this life, and what will we do with it? A terrorist is someone who has the intention to, to um, revenge, vengeance. That is a kind of deep desire. A terrorist also has seeds of compassion, of kindness, of peace, of joy, of love. But they have watered another kind of seed that drives them to do something very violent. So we can see the power of this kind of energy. And each of us, we need to know what we want to do with our life. How would we like to live? What talents that we have been transmitted would we like to cultivate? We are a wonder of the earth, and how will our particular flower in the garden of humanity sing her song? What is your song? How will you be a flower on this earth? What would you like to cultivate and to offer? That is our deepest desire, our volition. I came here because I wanted to transform and to live leanly, leanly. We have a wonderful word in English, leanly. It means um, simply, mm. just what is necessary in order to have more energy to, to act, to help to not destroy with my way of consuming. And the final one is consciousness. So we've been learning that consciousness is both individual and collective. And here, it's mostly, we're talking about collective consciousness. So The environments we are exposed to are a kind of food coming into our being. If you've ever been on a protest for social justice, <laughs> when everyone is collectively having a very strong energy, sometimes in, in a protest there is also an energy of anger, of demanding, and you may feel that you are carried by this collective consciousness. Or like now, we have a lot of fear and anxiety in the world at the moment. So that is coming in and triggering our own fear and anxiety. Or in our family, if something is happening in our family, certain seeds may be stronger at one time than another. Jealousy or anger, or at work, or in our friendship group. There's a kind of collective energy and we need to be aware what is being triggered in us by our environment. So we need to learn when to walk away, when to step out of the room, when to switch off the television. That is our freedom. That is empowering us to be the kind of person we would like to be. It is how we protect our mind and our body. Because when we have things that make us tense or afraid or anxious, we live that also in our body. This evening we will have a presentation on the five mindfulness trainings. And they are a wonderful path of practice, showing us how in our daily actions we can cultivate uh, our mind so that we can be the kind of person we would like to be, so that we can have more compassion, so that we can have more inner space, more freedom, 
more courage uh, to be able to make uh, wonderful use of this precious life that we have and to be able perhaps to, to serve the earth in ways that we would like to serve the earth. She needs our help. We need her, but she also needs us. Thank you for listening. <laughs>